You are welcome to this preview of the New Testament Epistle to the Colossians, chapter 2, verses 16 through 23, reading from the Legacy Standard Bible of 2020, noting 5th century or earlier manuscript variants between square brackets. Learning objectives include participants will be able to distinguish ideas from reality. Participants will be able to distinguish asceticism from Christian morality, and participants will articulate how to lead a moral life as a Christian. We are in the midst of the epistle, you must live as real Christians. And in our current discussion, you actually remain true Christians. If you are studying with a group, have someone read aloud verses 16 and 17. If you are studying alone, pause the video, read the verse carefully, and then restart the video. Allow others to make comments about the text or to pose queries about it before you share your own. Comment that popular Judaism in the first century CE carefully followed food restrictions, keeping festivals, new moon celebrations, and keeping of the Sabbath, whereas popular paganism valued asceticism, which they believed would lead to spiritual power and to revelatory experiences, much as popular religion to this day. It would be difficult to overemphasize the influence of the philosopher Plato. Plato, a pagan, distinguished the real world of ideas from the shadow world of sense experience, that is, the physical world that we experience expresses something deeper, greater, something more real. The very influential Jewish philosopher Philo, who lived between 20 BCE and 50 CE, developed Plato's concept to argue that the invisible God was known through shadows or copies of his character rather than through sensory vision. The Apostle Paul, the author of this epistle to the Colossians, a Jewish Christian, believed that the Old Testament prescriptions testified to genuine principles, but that those principles are fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ. We highly recommend the InterVarsity Press Bible Backgrounds Commentary. Have someone read aloud verse 18. Make their observations and pose their queries. From this text, identify three reward snatchers, practices that will diminish the rewards that Jesus Christ offers to his obedient followers. These include asceticism, spiritual mediators, and the search for personal visions. Then discuss what is the origin of these preoccupations. Find your reply in the text. These practices derive from a carnal mind, that is, human mentality deprived of Christian insight. What was the worship of angels? If this is an objective genitive, then it means worship offered to angels. However, such practices are strictly forbidden in First Testament texts, that is, the Hebrew Bible, in such texts as Deuteronomy and Jeremiah. However, if this is a subjective genitive, then it means worship offered by angels to God. In fact, such worship is commanded of the angels in the Septuagint and Dead Sea Scroll versions of Deuteronomy 32.43, as well as in Psalm 97.9. Look up those verses and read them. Professor Dunn comments, A Jewish or Christian-Jewish synagogue in Colossae 
perhaps delighted in their worship, Sabbath by Sabbath, as a participation in the worship of the angels in heaven. 1 Corinthians 11.10 recognizes the presence of angels in Christian worship. Since worship offered to angels was forbidden by the law and the prophets, this was probably not the problem at Colossae. Since worship offered by angels was commanded in the law and the Psalms, why was this a problem? Well, perhaps since angels worship Yahweh without mediation of Messiah Jesus, humans cannot join with them while still on earth, where we worship Yahweh through the only mediator, Jesus Christ. Read aloud this extensive fragment from the Dead Sea Scrolls. Wonderfully to praise your glory amongst the wise divine beings, extolling your kingdom amongst the utterly holy. They are honored in all the camps of the godlike beings and feared by those who direct human affairs, wondrous beyond other divine beings and humans alike. They tell of his royal splendor as they truly know it and exalt his glory in all the heavens of his rule. They sing wonderful psalms according to their insight throughout the highest heaven and declare the surpassing glory of the king of the godlike beings in the stations of their habitation. How shall we be reckoned amongst them, as what our priesthood in their habitations? How shall our holiness compare with their utter holiness? What is the praise of our mortal tongue alongside their divine knowledge? This could be the origin of some Jewish emphasis upon worship with the angels. Returning to our text, verse 19. After reading it aloud, observe that Christians are to observe that the idea of holding on to in the New Testament relates to Christian teaching, to Christian faith, to Christian hope, and to the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, rather than to ascetic practices or religious traditions. Notice that in this context, a body is supplied what it needs from outside itself, as implied by the Greek verb. It is held together by sound teaching, and it is God who gives its growth, not our human efforts. If you ask, how do we make the body grow? The right answer is that we do not. Read aloud verse 20. Note that a very influential philosophy of the time, Pythagoreanism. Pythagoras taught this philosophy from the 6th century BCE. It was being revived at the time of the New Testament. It taught vegetarianism, that is, abstinence from flesh meat, the seeking of intellectual discipline, the doing of mathematics, the following of purity rites, believing that souls will enter a new body after death of the present body. The decrees mentioned here are a verb in the Greek, to be dogmatized. Compare the word dogma as translated in 2.14. That is, this is a reference to Jewish religious laws and regulations. The phrase, you have died with Christ, directs us to a number of New Testament texts in which Christians consider themselves to be dead or to have been crucified with Christ. Galatians 2.20 says, Christ lives in me. I am exempt from religious law and rules. Our life is hidden with Christ in God. So we walk in newness of life. We are no longer enslaved to sin. We will live with Christ through faith, that we may bear fruit for God. In summary, Christian life, morality, and maturity derive from faith in Christ, neither from religion nor from human will or effort. 
Return to verses 21 and 22. The command not to touch reflects Genesis 3.3, where the woman added to God's command not to eat of the fruit of knowledge of good and evil by saying, we must not touch it lest we die. The strong emphasis upon false teaching reflects the language of the Septuagint Greek version of Jeremiah 29.12. In vain do they worship me, teaching human precepts and teachings. You may discuss together what are some current bogus religious teachings. Have someone read aloud verse 23. Note that another popular philosophy of the time was that of Stoicism, which taught that one must free oneself from bodily pleasures in order to contemplate his soul. And the practice of asceticism. Pagans who were becoming Christians brought their ascetic practices of self-denial with them into the new faith. Many mistook Christianity's abstaining from premarital sex and from drunkenness to be a form of asceticism. Teaching in your group provide basic teaching on seven paths to Christian morality. Morality starts with conversion. We have crucified our flesh, that is, our human nature, with its passions and desires. Secondly, we have received the Holy Spirit, so we walk by that Spirit, that is, we live by His empowerment. By faith, we reckon ourselves risen with Christ, with a promise that sin will not rule over us. We are obedient to Jesus Christ, who said, If you love me, then keep my commandments. There is an element of fear, for in questions of morality, the Lord is an avenger in all these things. Then we trust that when we are tempted, he will provide a way of escape. And then, if we love our neighbor as we do ourselves, we will do no wrong to that neighbor. We will not defraud them morally. Conclude your session by asking, What is one truth, insight, belief, or action that you have learned from this passage? Take time to pray one for another, asking God for strength to lead a life that pleases Him. Note that for your next study time, we are to read a chapter of Colossians each day in versions that we trust, and then to find in Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 17, ways in which God's chosen people conduct themselves.